So now that we have a basic idea of how we're going to analyze hashing algorithms, it's time to get to it and do some serious analysis. What's the basic model we have of the data? It's what's called the simple uniform hashing model. And it's a very straightforward idea. Remember that hash functions are supposed to be kind of random looking. If we're getting data from some place which is not maliciously being produced so that it always hashes to the same spot, we would expect that they would hash to all different spots sort of on average the same amount. So the basic idea here is that your data comes in independently. Every new data item is equally likely to go to any of the slots under the hash function and it's independent of all the previous ones. So if you think about it as being balls being thrown into bins, if I think about a bin or a bucket here, sometimes these things are called hash buckets, and I have a ball which is my data item and I just randomly throw it in, I'm expecting that every ball is equally likely to go in any of the bins and that's independent of whatever's already in there. So then we understand what a collision is, it's when there's a ball already in there and you hit it, right? And in the case of open addressing, in the case of chaining, it means you throw something to a bucket and the bucket already has something in it somewhere down here. Right. Now it's very obvious that if the load factor is very small, if you have hardly any elements at all in the table, hardly any balls, then you won't have very many collisions with you know, reasonable probability the expected number of collisions is very low. On the other hand, if you have a large number of balls, you'll have a lot of chance of getting a collision. So we need to quantify this. So let's imagine we have a set of buckets here and we're throwing these balls in randomly. I want to look at the probability of no collisions at all. when we throw n, the November balls, randomly into m bins, for example, under the simple uniform hashing model. So it's random, uniform at random for each ball, and those balls are independent. That's what that model is saying. I want that. And I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it Q of M for Mike, N for November. And I want to get some kind of expression for this function. Well, actually, I can, and it's reasonably simple, which is quite nice. It's not super simple, but it's, it's not too bad. The first ball I can throw in, and it will definitely not cause a collision. Then the second ball, once that first ball's in there, the second one will only collide with probability 1 over the number of slots. So the probability of no collision is actually m minus 1 over m. That's the probability that the second ball does not collide with the first one. Now given that we've had two balls in there and they haven't already collided, What's the probability that we don't have a collision with the next ball? Throw it in. There's m minus 2 free slots. Each of them is equally likely. Each of them occurs with probability 1 over m. So that's the probability that there's no collision with three balls. And if I keep doing this, I'm going to get decreasing numerators here. And the last one, in fact, is going to be m minus n plus 1. And I'm going to get an m on the bottom there. Now the key thing here is to notice is that this number is 1. This number is 1 minus 1 over m. So if m is a reasonable number, big size table, this is a fairly close to 1. This number is fairly close to 1. This is slightly less close to 1. When you get down to here, if n is like half of m, this is roughly a half. You have a whole lot of numbers which are reducing and you're multiplying them all together and how big is it? Some work required to analyze that. Compared to the analysis we've seen so far in these lectures, this is a little bit harder. What we're going to do is first look at some numerical results. 
Before we get to the more complicated numerical results, let's look at the really easy ones. We know that if zero balls are thrown, then we have no collision whatsoever. And we know that if there is one ball thrown, we must have no collision, so probability one of no collision. On the other hand, if we throw in at more than m balls, so a large number, we must have a collision. That's called the pigeonhole principle, right? If you have m for Mike pigeonholes and you throw in more than m items, at least one pigeonhole must have at least two items in it. But beyond that, it's difficult to work things out, you can see. So let's now have a look at some graphs. Now that we've got this function q, remember that q of m for Mike, n for November, is the probability that there are no collisions if you put n for November items into m for Mike slots. And this is what it looks like, and I've got four plots here for different values of m for Mike. So the top left plot is for m equals 25, then the one to the right, m is 100, bottom left, m is 400, bottom right, m is 1600. The horizontal axis in each plot is the value of n for November, and the value of the function and the probability we're measuring is in the vertical axis. So just have a look at these. You'll notice that the shape is sort of similar. Start, they start off at 1 when n is equal to 0. As you'd expect, the probability of a no collision is 1 then. You'll see there's an inflection point at some point in those curves. And then there's also a point where the value gets so small that it's indistinguishable from 0 in the plot that we have. Now one thing I want you to observe here is that when we look at the first plot, where we have m equals 25, that place where the probability gets very small is around n equals 15, 16, let's say. If you look closely at the next plot, where m is 100, you'll see that it's around, I'd say, 32. That point value of n for which the function value was so close to zero that we can't really make it out. And for 400, the bottom left plot, it's at around, I'd say, 64, roughly. And for the last plot, 128 is a reasonable guess. Now you've probably noticed how those numbers scaled. 16, 32, 64, 128. You should also think about how the value of M for Mike scaled. 25, 100, 400, 1600. You should be able to come up with a conjecture for how that value of N for November on the horizontal axis where the function becomes so small as to be indistinguishable from zero, should be able to work out how that scales as a function of m for Mike. How is it grow growing? It's clearly growing as m grows, but how? So stop this video now, think about this for at least two minutes. What we see is that as m is multiplied by 4, that's m for Mike, this particular value that we're looking at doubles. So you multiply something by 4, 
some other quantity doubles always, that means that the second quantity is scaling like the square root of the first quantity. In other words, the point at which the probability of no collision becomes vanishingly small is growing like square root of the size of the table. So that has some clear implications. It means that once the table is not even very full, the square root, right? If we have a million items in the table, potentially an array of size a million, but we only have a thousand items in it, then we should be expecting quite a few collisions as we keep throwing more balls into these bins randomly. Now, because collisions are so prevalent in this model, it's pretty clear that when we're dealing with open addressing, we have to consider collisions much earlier than we might have originally thought. And that makes it really important to make sure that we have a good collision resolution policy. We always needed one, but we're going to need it even a lot earlier than we thought. Even for quite empty tables, we're going to need to know what to do with collisions. How long does it take on average to find something? Well, you have to follow down the list. The average list length here is equal to the load factor, lambda. So, on average, intuitively, you're about halfway down the average list. This is a very simple way to think about it. And so something like lambda over 2 should be the average amount of effort required to find an element. Of course, in the worst case, it could be bad because it might degenerate to a big long chain with all the elements in it. But if we're randomly throwing balls into bins in this way, this is basically the expected number of probes that we need to find an element. Very close to that. So the key thing we want, of course, with hash tables is fast runtime for lookup. In particular, and it's very easy to do here as long as lambda is kept under control. As long as we don't have too many balls per bin on average, in fact, it's going to be quite easy on average to find things. That's fairly straightforward. Now, as for what this value of lambda should be in practice, it's a different story. The key thing for hash tables is that they're often used for enormous amounts of data. For example, they're used for internet routers that have to look up where to send a packet of data. There's some big list of other machines to be sent to, and there are hash values associated with these. And you have to be very quick, because in real time, data is coming in. So lookups have to be super quick. Constant time is what you want, for sure, but even the value of the constant could be important here. You know, 10 might be too many. So it will turn out that if lambda gets too big, what you'll have to do is rehash. Spend a bit of time to copy everything over to a larger array, maybe twice as big. Recalculate all the addresses there and continue from there. It just depends on how much data you have in your application and the requirements you have for speed as to when you need to do that. The key thing is the basic operations can be done in constant time, in fact, on average, as long as the load factor is kept under control and bounded. Now, the load factor lambda is also relevant in the analysis of open addressing hashing, but it's more complicated. We have to assume a few things. So the first thing to notice is that we're assuming that the initial hash function is essentially randomly distributing our data. Random balls and bins model. That's fine, but then we need to resolve the collisions. One obvious point is that if you use linear probing, and you go from here, and you probe to the left till you find a space, that you don't have some kind of uniform distribution of data after that. You get these clusters forming, because you only go as far as you need to, and you form a cluster. So all possible arrangements of the data in the table are not equally likely. So the analysis is a bit harder. 
Turns out, I'm just going to quote this, this is well beyond what we're going to do here. We're looking at order 1 over 1 minus lambda squared as the runtime for the basic operations lookup, for example. Now the problem here is that as lambda gets close to 1, this function here blows up, tends to infinity, so there'll be a point beyond which the table is over full. It won't be completely full, but it will be over full for all practical uses. Notice that if you have lambda here and 1 over 1 minus lambda, I'm going to use this later on, so I'll put it there, and 1 over 1 minus lambda squared, suppose that you have a table that's half full, 3 quarters, 90%. And you see here that you really don't want to let your table get anywhere near this full if you want good performance with hashing, with linear probing. Now why have I put this thing here? That's because it turns out this is for linear probing, but for double hashing, double hashing we assume that things come in randomly and then they move in some random way. The basic assumption we're going to make is that we do this so nicely that every possible arrangement of the data, so we've got M for Mike slots and N for November items, those items are arranged in such a way that all possible arrangements are equally likely. If we assume that, double hashing is actually pretty well described by that, and the analysis of that model shows, in fact, that the runtime is of order 1 over 1 minus lambda, so here we have it here. So, no proofs at this stage for any of those. But these are the basic performance guarantees that you expect. Don't forget, average. So when I say guarantee, it's an average case guarantee of how things are going to work. What we really want in practice then is to be very careful about load factors that get large. And in practice, that's what happens. Rehashing is undertaken as long as you get more than, say, here. It's quite rare for tables to get 90% full in practice. This gives you an idea, though, of when you might want to start worrying in a particular application, depending on how fast you need to be. So again, as with chaining, for open addressing, the key point is that as long as the load factor is under control and not too big, bounded, the total runtime for basic operations will be order one, will be constant time. If you're never more than three quarters full, it'll never take more than some constant times four probes on average to find things, right? Just remembering that, of course, the worst case, things could be very bad. So here we are again at the questions. Now, I've quoted some results about the analysis of uniform hashing and linear probing hashing. Can we actually prove anything at this level, or do you have to take it on faith? Well, it turns out that you can understand, and maybe even derive for yourself, the analysis of uniform hashing. I wouldn't expect you to work out the analysis of linear probing hashing, it's a bit more complicated. By the way, the whole subject of analysis of algorithms was really founded by Donald Knuth, probably the most famous living computer scientist. You might want to look him up on Wikipedia, for example. He's an extremely interesting character. He analyzed linear probing hashing in about 1962. It started off the entire field. Before then, algorithm analysis was really done just empirically, which is really far from satisfactory. Now the next point, remember we saw these graphs that showed various probabilities of collisions for various values of m and n, and you could see there was some kind of scaling happening there. What we want to do is think about what happens more generally. So again, the question is, can we do anything analytically there? Before you do that, I'd like you to think about uh, this problem. We discussed the issue of what happens 
down here when we get probability close to zero of no collision. What about here? Let's just pick the specific value of half. For example, think about this for an example. Assuming that people's birthdays are random and you have a class full of students, how many students do you have to have before the probability is more than a half that you have a collision in birthdays? At least two people have the same birthday. It's the famous birthday problem, obviously very closely related to our analysis of hashing. Have a think about that yourself before you look it up. Think about it intuitively yourself. How many people would you need in a class before you would bet even money that at least two of them have the same birthday? What do you think? Then once you've thought about that, go back and look at the graphs that we showed before. They're a little difficult to view, but see what your estimate is on those and whether it's coherent with the guess you just made about the birthday problem. In other words, have a look at this part of the graph. Beyond that, it's a bit difficult to deal with in this course. We won't be able to rigorously derive the results, okay, but I should be able to tell you about them. Finally, hashing is extremely important in practice. It's used by every major library and every major language to help implement the table or dictionary abstract data type. But we've seen various types of hashing. Lots of choices could be made, open addressing versus chaining, etc. So what choices have been made by developers? That's something for you to look up. A bit of internet research. Find out your favorite language and find out how hashing is actually implemented at the moment. So, think about those. We'll see you next time.